about 4 to 14 billion livestock uh, on the planet and they produce a lot of dung. And that dung can be uh, a problem if it doesn't decompose fast enough and it becomes a problem of waste management as in many parts of the US. Uh, or that dung can provide a very good resource uh, if it decomposes, gets re recycled into the soil and is used by a number of other organisms, plants and so on. So the rates of dung decomposition and who is doing the decomposition is quite important to know. So what happened a few years ago to understand this is about 80 people across the country of Finland from north to south went out in a coordinated way and they went to cattle uh, farms and they picked up 20 liters of cow dung. And they divided these 20 liters of cow dung into uh, 15 equal parts and they did various things with these different parts and put them back into the pasture. Uh, some of them they covered with fine mesh to exclude um, insects that might come in and process the dung. Uh, some they covered with coarse mesh so that only the larger insects were excluded and not the smaller insects. Uh, for some, some dung pads, they put cloth underneath the dung before they put it back so that earthworms couldn't come and access. For others, they put mesh so that earthworms could come in but not other, uh, other invertebrates, insects and so on. Um, so, 80 people did this, uh, roughly 80 different farms uh, across uh, Finland. The idea was to understand what's happening to, what is the rate of decomposition, how does it vary from north to south, and uh, who is doing the biggest job in decomposition. Um, and it turned out that, as they suspected, that in southern Finland decomposition rates are faster because it's warmer. But regardless of whether you were in the north or the south, uh, among the invertebrates, a particular uh, class of dung beetles called door beetles, these are earth-boring dung beetles, uh, they remove dung at a rate twice as fast as all the other invertebrates put together. So these large door beetles are really, really very important for the process of dung removal and decomposition uh, in Finland. And this is significant because of the three door beetles that Finland has, one is nearly gone, the other is declining, the second one is declining very rapidly. And so this is uh, important to know if the million head of cattle in Finland are to be kept in a uh, pasture that's healthy and the uh, nutrients are being recycled and so on. It turns out that across the world there's a lot of interest in decomposition. Decomposition has an ecosystem process, uh, as an ecosystem service if you can call it that. And uh, some people have tried to standardize, trying to measure decomposition rates in soils across the, across the planet. This has implications for climate change and carbon emission and all, all these kinds of things. And there's something very interesting I stumbled upon, which is called the Teabag Index Project. Um, as it turns out that earlier, uh, when you do it formally, when researchers do this, they have things called leaf litter bags. They uh, pack leaf litter in these nylon bags and then bury them under the soil and then dig them up after some time. But if you want lots of people to do this across the world, to get a survey of decomposition rates in many different parts, uh, then you can't send around these bags and the leaf litter is not standardized and all these sorts of things. So uh, researchers have standardized using tea bags, uh, or Lipton tea of two particular types, uh, green tea and red bush tea, rooibos tea from uh, South Africa. Um, and this is an interesting project. Actually, anybody can participate. Uh, I'll give you the website, but one can do it right here. You just get these uh, tea bags, you bury them, a uh, particular um, depth in the soil in your garden and then you dig them up after three months and then you uh, measure their weight and then you send in uh, the weight of these two tea bags and you can replicate that if you like uh, uh, to the group that's coordinating this and they will tell you what it, what it all means and I don't understand fully what it means. But a really interesting way of um, coming up with a user-friendly standardized method uh, that actually can yield very interesting results uh, even globally. One of my favorite uh, projects across the world is called the Great Sunflower Project. And uh, despite its name, it's not really about sunflowers, it's about pollinators. And as you might know, there's been a lot of concern about, about pollinator declines all over the world, uh, especially in the US. Pollinators um, provide billions of dollars of services to various kinds of fruit and other uh, agricultural products. Uh, and there's concern over declines, there's also concern about a particular pesticide that might be associated with these declines, these pesticides called neonicotinoids. So um, the Great Sunflower Project started to try and map the population of pollinators across the, uh, across the US. And how do you do this? 
um, the, the lady who came up with this, she was a, a PhD student at, that, at the time, she said, well, why don't we do this? Uh, I'll start a website and I'll say, if somebody wants to participate, what they need to do is uh, sign up, I'll send them a bag of sunflower seeds of a particular variety of sunflower, so it's standardized across the country, they plant the sunflower in their garden, and when the, when the sunflower grows and blooms, then they spend, they take a, a chair, sit near the sunflower and spend 10 minutes watching the sun, sunflower, counting how many times pollinators visit. And that was the basic uh, project to begin with, and since then it became more uh, sophisticated. Uh, people were asked not only to count how many pollinators visited, but what pollinators they were. Um, they started watching other kinds of uh, flowers, not just sunflowers. And they started also collecting information on the use of pesticides in their neighborhood, in their garden, so that those uh, pollinator visits and, uh, and other variables could be associated with one another. Uh, so uh, here's, for example, some information from the uh, Eight Sunflower Project's website on the average pollinator visits uh, per hour per flower. And you can see that it varies tremendously. Uh, some of the averages are uh, less than one visit per hour per flower and uh, some of them go up to 100 uh, visits per hour per flower. And this has been the first uh, sort of almost continent-wide survey of uh, the health of pollinators and this in fact has been tracked year over year and you can see, they can see now which areas have the highest sun, uh, pollinator declines and in which areas are pollinators uh, more or less stable in their numbers. It's a really old example uh, from the 1940s of uh, birds in the UK and then across Europe opening milk bottles. So milk bottles um, before the 1920s uh, in, uh, or milk I should say, was delivered to British households in open bottles. And several species of birds were observed to drink the cream from, uh, to eat the cream from, the, uh, from these open bottles. Birds can't digest milk but they can digest the cream, that, the fat that uh, accumulates on top. But in the 1920s, uh, this changed because milk bottles started to be delivered with a cap on them, either a metal cap, it started with a cardboard cap and then a metal cap. And in the 1920s, it was uh, first noticed that the birds that used to, so the birds that used to drink the cream couldn't do it anymore. In the 1920s, we noticed that some species, like the great tit and the blue tit, uh, started in some areas, started to be able to open up the caps of these bottles. And then this behavior spread. And some people were interested in uh, how was it that this behavior could spread? Was it that the birds were discovering uh, the way to open milk bottles afresh every time? Or were they learning from one another? Were they dispersing from a place where they learned to another place? And so um, they started a project, uh, so rather they advertised and got 400 uh, responses from members of the British public about where people had seen these great tits and blue tits open milk bottles and what year they first saw this, and whether they were in a position to have observed it if it had happened in earlier years. And from that, in a paper published in 1949, they were able to make a map of the spread of this habit of uh, opening milk bottles. And so this is my uh, animation of this map. I apologize, it's a bit crude, because I just scanned these photos, uh, these maps and put them together. Uh, so this shows, um, number the locations of, of uh, where this uh, behavior had been observed before 1935, then 1939, 41, 43, and 45. And from the spread of this, the authors argue, we can make some inferences about the spread of the, the behavior, how it, how it actually transmits, or whether it transmits at all. And because the birds don't disperse very well, they argue that actually what's happening is that there's a few number of independent discoveries of this technique of opening, uh, opening milk, milk bottles and then local learning from among in the population that's very close by. So you get these nuclei of uh, fresh discoveries followed by a burst of uh, the uh, spread of this innovation. And this actually spread into uh, Europe as well, into mainland Europe as well. Coming back again to the present day, uh, this is a, a very nice project called Snapshot Serengeti. Um, since uh, 2010, 225 camera traps have been placed uh, across the Serengeti National Park, one particular part of the Serengeti National Park, by researchers who are interested in understanding how uh, predators and prey uh, interact, and also how predators interact with one another. For example, uh, do lions and hyenas and cheetahs, do they divide up the habitat so that they don't overlap much in their use of space? 
or do they actually overlap completely and there's no, no actual competitive exclusion, they don't exclude each other from uh, the use of space. And so uh, from these 220 camera types, they gathered this information and originally they were trying to classify these photographs, but of course the volume was too much. Uh, because since uh, 2010 to 2015, about 2 million sets of images have been captured. Each set is about 2 or 3 images that click very rapidly in succession. Um, and uh, so what they did was they said, well, let's see if people might be interested in helping us to classify these photos. Many of the photos don't have an animal in them. Uh, and uh, those that do have an animal, the animal can be identified. And so this website, uh, you can go, in fact, right now, I, I've done a bit of this, very, very nice. Because it also teaches you how to identify these uh, large mammals in the Serengeti ecosystem. Uh, and there are various keys you use and you click through and you can identify what's there. And during the course of this, about 10 million classifications have been done so far. Because obviously uh, a single classification, a single identification is not enough for a photo. So what they do is they try and get at least 10, collect 10 classifications. And if all 10 agree on whether it's a zebra, then the system marks it as zebra and it's done and gets removed from the pool of photos that need to be classified. Uh, all this information is put out in the public domain. It's a very, very interesting uh, project to take part in. I want to come down to a uh, no, much more local example. This is one right in our backyard here, where a very uh, local group called Mysore Nature wanted to learn more about their birds uh, in their city. And so what they've uh, done is to set up grids uh, cells of about two by two kilometers um, across Mysore city. Uh, that's 33 grid cells. And uh, they had a particular protocol for sampling uh, for going and surveying birds in these grid cells. And this was done uh, in uh, February and June of both 2014 and 2015, and it's repeating now in February of 2016. But there's two years of information they have across the, all of Mysore, each, each grid cell being equally sampled, so you don't have these sampling biases where, um, where you get information only from places with good habitat, but you don't, you don't get information on places with so-called poor habitat. And from this, this is an overall species richness map, and you can see that there are some grid cells, for example, this one down here, and this one up here, that have uh, over, a, I haven't put a key, but they have over 100 species recorded in that two by two kilometer uh, set. And there are other grid cells over here in the middle that have uh, less than half that number of species. And of course, as you would suspect, it, uh, this uh, uh, relates to habitat. Uh, for example, both of these dark colored grid cells uh, have lakes in them, uh, and the uh, light colored grid cells are in the middle of the city with lots of uh, urban built up area and very little green space. So these results aren't surprising, but they actually a very nice first documentation, a formal documentation of what bird diversity Mysore has across its different habitats and land use types and uh, has, as we can think of, potential uses for the future. Um, there's also interesting information about the movement of birds. It's just an example. One bird, black drongo, which we normally think of as a resident bird, doesn't move around very much. But black drongo, it turns out, uh, populates most of Mysore. This is about 2014 and 2015. Uh, and this is February, the winter. So in the winter, it's all over Mysore. Uh, but in June, it all but disappears from the city. So uh, what they're probably doing is they're going outside the city to breed. But we don't know for sure. But it's really interesting that this pattern has come up and that can lead to further investigation. So just an example from our backyard, um, a, a very local example run by a local group. So all these are examples uh, of what we might call citizen science. Um, some people like this phrase, some people don't. There are many alternative versions, none of which is perfect. But basically all we mean uh, by this term is um, where there is a larger public involvement in the process of gathering information, making sense of information, uh, in, in research, broadly defined. Um, and that, this approach to doing things uh, is firstly not new. Um, we have two uh, people here who are not professional scientists but who made a huge contribution to science, so Charles Darwin uh, and Alan Hume, A.O. Hume. And Darwin, of course, himself was, uh, his profession was not uh, biology. Um, and in addition, he had a huge network of correspondents of all across the world, most of which, uh, the vast majority of whom are also uh, uh, amateurs, amateurs being, in this context, being people who have great expertise in their field, but didn't make their living out of it. 
and he corresponded to them. Of course, we know uh, Darwin's contribution to the world. A.O. Hume as well uh, uh, was a, um, an amateur in the sense that I described also had a large network of correspondence. Uh, so this is in the mid-1800s we're talking about. In the first organized, what we might call citizen science uh, project, was probably uh, in Finland, back in Finland, uh, which started in 1749 to understand the dates of migration of birds. And people weren't interested in the birds themselves necessarily in those days. They were more interested in what uh, the dates of migration uh, might tell them about uh, forecasting the weather, about uh, shipping channels and which channels might be free of ice and those sorts of things. So there were actually strong economic reasons, at least they thought, to understand this. Uh, the various examples from a long time ago of information being gathered by the larger public uh, and contributing to some, some stated purpose. So what is it that we can do uh, with citizen science? What are the different things that can be, can be studied? Some of these things we've talked about al already. Uh, so we've talked about some ecosystem processes. I have to confess here that my background is mostly in, in birds and work on birds. Um, and I've worked a bit in the UK and a little bit in the US. So my examples are also biased towards those places. We can discuss a little bit about uh, other, other examples. So ecosystem processes like um, uh, water flow, hydrology, um, uh, decomposition I've talked about. I should also say that there's a large amount of work in citizen science on things like pollution, air quality, water quality, noise. I'm not talk talking about those because I'm focusing more on ecology uh, in this talk, but there's a huge amount of very, very interesting and very applied work in those fields. Um, we can study animal behavior. Uh, the example with the, with the, the birds opening milk bottles is one. And I just want to give you this uh, small example that the citizen science can actually be on a very small scale and very significant, um, both in terms of generating new information as well as in, in, uh, in education. So here's an example uh, of um, a study trying to understand <clears throat> whether bumblebees can be trained to solve puzzles. And this project was devised and run by eight-year-old uh, children in a particular school in England. It was done with the advice and input of a biologist, but all the questions that were decided to be asked came from the children, the design of the study came from the children, through back and forth, uh, through discussion and so on. And it was very interesting. So the basic question was, we know that bees can uh, be trained and can, can learn to distinguish colors and go to flowers of a particular color. They can also be trained and they can learn to go to flowers at a particular location and ignore flowers at a different location because these flowers are better. But can they be trained to recognize an arbitrary pattern and uh, choose to go to locations within that arbitrary pattern? And so the arbitrary pattern that the students, the children uh, chose was they wanted to know whether uh, bees can, can be trained to go to a cluster of blue flowers, these are fake flowers, cluster, surrounded by yellow, and the converse, a cluster of yellow flowers surrounded by blue. Uh, so an arbitrary puzzle had to be solved, the police had to learn how to solve this puzzle and then had to, um, after they are trained, had to actually solve it in a testing situation. And without going through the details, uh, the children uh, designed this, implemented it, collected the information and wrote the scientific paper that got published in uh, uh, an international journal. They wrote it as children would write. Not written in the in the formal sense of a, a scientific paper. It has no literature cited. There's no background because these are children, eight year old children. Um, and it's a really nice example where um, one can do very very local science. This may not have an application for conservation, but it's still scientific research that actually produces new findings that were not known before at all. But also involves. Uh, people, uh, in this case children, right from the start, in, in thinking about what it is that needs to be asked, why it should be asked, how are we going to ask this kind of question, and how are we going to answer it, and actually do all this, uh, implement all this. Uh, disease is one example, uh, another example. I want to uh, give this example of uh, the house finch in North America. Um, there's a project called Feeder Watch. Uh, and I think this project started in the uh, mid-80s where, uh, you know, in, in, in America and in England as well, in Europe, uh, many people put out feeders in their gardens, bird feeders, and, and put uh, seed and uh, fat uh, for birds to eat during the winter. 
so this project Feeder Watch has been going on for uh, quite a while. In 1992, if I remember correct, 94, in Washington DC, uh, somebody noticed uh, these house finches with a particular kind of disease. And this is called mycoplasmal conjunctivitis was confirmed later on and it leads to a swelling of the eyes and a, a, a discharge or an incrustation of the eyes and where, uh, birds can't see um, if they have a severe form of the infection and they, and they die. Now, house finches are interesting because house finches didn't occur originally in the eastern part of the US. They occur in the western part, that's their natural range. But they used to be taken for the bird trade to the eastern part and when once that bird trade was made illegal, people released their captive house finches and the house finches colonized the eastern part of the US. So they were not native in their range, uh, but they had started spreading. Once they were released, they started spreading. So this was interesting uh, <clears throat> because here we've got an example of a disease and the interest was in trying to understand firstly how house finches are spreading but also what influence the disease has on the population of house finches. So um, a specific project within this Feeder Watch project was, uh, was devised to track the spread of this disease. It's not so easy because this disease can be confused with a couple of other diseases and so on. So there had to be quite a bit of you know, fine uh, sort of education and, and uh, identification of the particular disease. So what uh, was found in terms of the spread of the disease is 1994 in Washington DC and the disease spread very rapidly uh, across the eastern coast and also inland as the house finch population spread, as the distribution of these invasive house finches in the eastern US spread. And what's happened more recently is actually the uh, eastern house finches have jumped across the Rocky Mountain barrier and have colonized the west. And the disease has also jumped across and colonized the west. So uh, the people were able to track the spread of this disease in very, very fine scale in a wild population. Very, very unusual. Actually the first time uh, that wild population disease would be tracked over space, but also over time. And there's other information that shows that this disease originally um, was not very virulent. It didn't cause, uh, wasn't as severe, it didn't cause so many deaths when the house finches were at low population size. And when the house finches reached high population densities, then the disease has evolved much higher virulence and much higher mortality rates. Such that in some places, uh, actually overall the estimate is that disease has killed about 50% of house, house finches where in those populations where house finches were infected. Um, and there are interesting ecological evolution, evolutionary reasons for the, the change in the virulence of a disease, we won't get into that. But the fact of the matter is that by having tens of thousands of, of people watching house finches and noting down when they found a disease individual, uh, this kind of detailed map, maps of the spread of not just the finches but also the disease were able to be arrived at. Um, so, moving on to some other examples, seasonality is a very obvious one. Uh, Thomas talked about phenology and uh, phenological programs, the timing of seasonal events. This has been of interest for a long, long time. And the example from Finland that I talked to you about was one example of this. Uh, cherry, uh, the, the flowering of cherry trees has been noted since about the 8th century in Japan. Like there's one shrine in Japan where I believe from the 8th century is an unbroken record, pretty much unbroken record about the first flowering of the cherry tree uh, because it's such an important cultural event. <clears throat> and for, um, uh, for people in temperate regions, of course, the first sign of spring, which means the first uh, leaf leaves emerging or the first flowers emerging are very important. And what some of these studies have been able to do is also show us uh, the um, uh, effects of changing climate. So there's an example down here, I don't think you can see it. Uh, from a, a project in Canada called Plant Watch, which collects information on the first date of flowering and leaf emergence and so on of many species. And if uh, when they compared uh, their information between uh, 2001 and 2012, on average this first date of flowering uh, across 19 species had advanced by uh, 9 days in this 10 or 11 year period. So the first date of flowering had advanced, that was coming earlier in the spring by nine days, which is what we expect with warming climates. And um, I say we don't know enough, so there's good evidence now across the temperate region for changing uh, seasonality in bird migration and plant flowering and various other seasonal events. We don't know quite as much, we know very little actually in tropical regions like our own. Um, here's another example of uh, seasonality, this is bird migration now. And um, uh, this comes from a large database of observations of birds. 
each of these dots represents a species. It's a center point, it's a centroid of the distribution of the species. Of uh, these are 118 species of migratory birds in the Americas. Um, and you can see as it comes to winter, they're all coming down. Uh, to the south, some birds winter in the southern part of northern America, or they winter down in South America. And then this is now uh, winter. Now as we come to the, get warmer and come to the spring, uh, the birds move up. So this, each dot is a species again. And uh, this has been made possible because of hundreds of millions of observations on, on birds in the Americas. Um, and from this one can make out uh, three general patterns of migration. There are some birds that migrate north, uh, okay, so some birds that migrate south along land and go back north over the Caribbean, over here. So they make this kind of anti-clockwise migration. Uh, there are a few other species that actually make a clockwise migration, not as many. And there are a few remaining species that just migrate up and down over land. Um, so this again is a depiction of the, the migration cycle of a large number of species uh, made possible only because hundreds of thousands of people have contributed their observations of birds, uh, contributed millions of observations of birds uh, over time. Um, basic distribution, of course, sometimes we don't have that information. Uh, in India, certainly, we don't have that information for the vast majority of, uh, of taxa or species. Uh, here is uh, something called the Atlas of the British and Irish uh, Flora, and this is a distribution map of the, the white willow. Um, and uh, distribution map, maps like these uh, for the British Isles certainly are available for nearly any taxon you can think of. Um, they have very, very detailed distribution information. Um, but we also want to know about uh, change uh, in distribution or population. And here's an example from butterfly, again from the UK. This is from the UK butterfly monitoring scheme, uh, where there are um, many hundreds of transects that are, that are run every year. So this blue, the map, the blue dots indicates the location of transects, butterfly transects that are uh, surveyed every year. And from this, what they've been able to do is from 1995 onwards, setting 1995 to a, just a, a standard at 100%, they were able to track the change in uh, population of uh, their butterflies uh, species by species and also aggregated overall. So here, this is aggregated here for woodland butterflies, uh, woodland specialists in green and farmland specialists in brown. And you can see that both for woodland and farmland butterflies in, uh, in the UK, uh, there's been a decline and a particularly rapid decline perhaps between 2003-2007. These are really interesting uh, uh, pieces of information because they tell us which aspects of our biodiversity are in most trouble and which might need most attention. So I wanted to pause here because this, so far what I've spoken about is um, citizen science and the contribution we can make to our general understanding of the world. Uh, how the world works, like with the decom ecosystem processes or how animals behave or where they are and how they are changing. Um, but because part of this talk is supposed to be about conservation, um, I think it would be interesting to talk about how this kind of information or other kinds of information might, uh, collected through citizen science um, might be of most use in actual application, in policy, in action, in management and so on. So at this point I thought perhaps we could just have a have a discussion here, and maybe even particularly in the Indian context, uh, but possibly more globally. How do you think some of this information could be used or could be better collected, or perhaps other kinds of information, other kinds of projects could be devised that had a more a specific conservation target and conservation outcome? Can you think in the areas that you work, uh, where uh, can you think of any such uh, ideas? Not necessarily actual running examples, but just new you know, ideas. Um, so I just have a couple more uh, slides just to uh, uh, wind this up. So of course, uh, sorry, one part of it is uh, information gathering. We, we talked about several of the points that came up was about were about information gathering, and um, and they do can input into conservation. They're not conservation itself, but they can be inputs into conservation. Here's just an example of the uh, map of the spread of this invasive species which we have in India, called Eurasian Collardus, into North America. And um, 
you can see uh, I should wait till it ticks over. But uh, when this time series starts in 1979, there's hardly any reports. It's all citizen science information. And then you can see for the first 10 or uh, 20 years, nothing much happens. But in 2000s onwards, there's been a massive spread of uh, this uh, invasive bird into uh, North America. And of course, the converse can also be tracked. That is uh, the decline of uh, species. And I always speculate about whether if we had uh, people uh, pooling their information in a common, uh, common source, common repository, uh, in the early 90s, just before our vulture started to decline, whether we would have uh, picked up on this uh, fact that it's not a single place decline. The, I should say that the first place that, the first warning that vultures were declining were from Bharatpur, where a particular researcher, Vibhu Prakash, was studying them. And he saw that they were declining rapidly in Bharatpur. But the recognition that this was a widespread problem, not just restricted to one particular area, might have come faster if we had this kind of information already coming in then. But at any rate, we have something like this going on now. So uh, from now on, we'll have less and less excuse uh, to uh, plead ignorance if, in fact, uh, at least for our birds, some of the bird species start declining. We should be able to pick, pick up on this fairly rapidly uh, and you know, and then try and devise, uh, uh, you know, find out why it's happening and devise solutions. So, um, some examples of policy, not from, uh, not from India, but um, this is uh, from the UK. The UK has something called the Wild, Wild Bird Index, which is derived from a number of common bird monitoring schemes uh, uh, run in the UK, all collected uh, with uh, bird watchers, general public. And uh, Wild Bird Index here again starts at 1970 at uh, some arbitrary number of 100%. And for all species as a whole, wild birds in the UK are doing okay. But uh, for farmland, uh, for woodland, and especially farmland species, there's a tremendous decline. Now, the reason I'm showing this is that the wild bird index is recognized by the US, uh, the UK government, as uh, one of their 15 indicators of the quality of life in the UK. So it's an official, official indicator of the quality of life, one of which there's health, there's environment, there is education, there is indicators, one of which is an index of uh, wildlife, of biodiversity. And the UK government is obliged to take action if this quality of the aggregate or the uh, separate quality of life indicators decline. So recognizing some of these uh, biodiversity indexes in uh, policy documents can help, at least in some way, it can help focus attention on these things, it can help mobilize resources, um, and so on. So this is an example from the UK, but this is also uh, an index like this about wild birds is also uh, recognized as the EU as a whole. The EU as part of their in, in indices of how well the EU as a whole is doing also has biodiversity indices like this. And I just want to give you an example of uh, unexpected ways in which information gathered in citizen science can be of use. Uh, this example comes from Kerala, and it comes from uh, a Kollam district in uh, in Kerala, where uh, in October 1994 there was an outbreak of bird flu in a turkey farm, and uh, and of course what happens? Lots of birds get culled. There's a big hoo-ha in the newspapers, and everybody says, "Oh, it's migratory birds. Winter's coming. Migratory birds have brought uh, the flu, and uh, something has to be done with the migratory birds." Now it's true that migratory waterfowl do harbor. Uh, bird flu in their populations, and it's true that it's possible that it can be transmitted from them to uh, domestic uh, poultry. Um, but it's not necessarily the case, and it's important to find out whether it's happening or not. So there was this uh, speculation in the media and the government department, the concerned government department also, you know, they convenient to say that uh, our surveillance measures in the domestic poultry are perfectly fine, it's these wild birds that are bringing in uh, new infections of bird flu. And so when it hit the media and um, some uh, bird watchers in Kerala started looking at this. They said, "Oh, that's interesting. We, from this year on, uh, this year we'll actually have information about birds, including migratory waterfowl, uh, and their change over time. So let's see whether uh, this could, in fact, be the case." So they went and looked at the information and looked at the, the uh, reports of uh, migratory uh, ducks and other waterfowl, and they found that actually, at the time that the first cases of the bird flu were reported. There were hardly any of the waterfowl, dagenies and pintails are the main species, so these are two species of ducks. Um, the dagenies and pintails came in numbers only much later in the middle of November. Um, and so they said, this is uh, strange, it doesn't rule out the possibility that those first one or two straggling uh, dagenies and pintails might have brought the flu, but it 
then is it less likely and uh, this information was in the public domain they uh, sent the uh, charts and uh, the information to uh, government officials and the media as well there were follow up articles in the media and uh, after that this wide speculation that uh, or why let's say it was a firm conclusion that people had drawn that uh, wild birds had brought in this infection uh, pretty much tailed off and, and disappeared because people realized that it was actually quite unlikely and the information was there to uh, assess whether it could have been likely that uh, migratory waterfowl had brought bird flu that had infected these uh, these turkeys so not something that was anticipated not something that the information was collected in order to address but it was just an unintended and nice uh, outcome of this i should say that it's still possible that, you know wild birds do transmit bird flu just because you like wild birds doesn't mean that you think that they're pristine and clean and all that but we need to know whether indeed it's happening or not uh, if we want to solve the problem so uh, what can we do uh, to uh, uh, help in these uh, these kinds of projects if we uh, if we're interested of course we can contribute our observations we can participate in a variety of different kinds of citizen science projects uh, whichever ones we we are interested in we have the expertise if expertise is needed we can help in reviewing uh, and curating data and thomas showed how uh, um, a uh, in fact a small number of individuals relatively small can have a very large uh, positive impact on the uh, information as a whole by volunteering their time in, in reviewing and uh, curating. We can start special interest groups and these interest groups can be clustered around a particular taxon, they can be uh, clustered around a particular area of interest, a particular project uh, and that's, uh, that's great. And we can design and implement projects and if we are interested in information gathering, these can be information gathering projects purely. If we are really interested in on-ground action and conservation then we need to do more work. And we try and understand who the uh, stakeholders are, who are the people who are going to actually implement any changes on the ground, and we need to sort of build bridges to draw them together so that everybody together designs and implements this project so that the information gathered can actually be used uh, for conservation. Um, I was going to stop here. I, I intended the earlier discussion to be purely about conservation and this discussion here to be about what can we do in India, but actually, a lot of that has come out already in the earlier discussion about what are the constraints and what maybe are some of the opportunities uh, like Pranoy pointed out uh, in our local context. So I think I'm out of uh, time. Um, so I'll end there and I don't know if uh, Thomas will allow a few questions. Thank you so much. <laughs>